Well, thank you, Dr. Robinson, and good morning, doctors. Great to join you this morning. Today, we live in a world that's striving for sustainability. If you work at a company, one of your goals is to provide sustainable products or sustainable services. If you're at a university, one of your goals is to be sustainable. And many universities now are collecting a, a sustainability fee in the college tuitions. If you go to Amazon, you'll find more than 35,000 books that deal with the topic of sustainability. We have sustainability, sustainable agriculture, sustainable transportation, the sustainable company, sustainable communities and environmental justice, sustainable America, sustainable capitalism, capitalism. and my favorite is sustainable swine nutrition. But, but what do we mean by sustainable development? Well, the United Nations defined it back in 1987. Sustainable development is meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And note that the United Nations went on to say it should become a guiding principle of the United Nations, of governments, of private institutions, organizations, and enterprise. In other words, a global mandate. Then in 1992, with the Rio de Janeiro Earth Summit, Agenda 21 went a little bit further and a little bit more uh, ominous. The growth of world population and production combined with unsustainable production patterns places increasingly severe stress on the life-supporting capacities of our planet. In other words, normal human development, growth, business, economy is unsustainable. And then last year at Planet Under Pressure, humanity has taken a huge leap and become a planetary scale force. Significant changes have occurred since the 1950s and the rate of change is accelerating. Researchers observe unsafe levels of pollution, ecological change and resource demand with potentially catastrophic consequences for our global civilization. The ideology of sustainable development is based on three foundations. First, that humankind is destroying the climate. Second, that mankind is increasingly polluting our world. And third, that we're running the world out of resources. And to solve all these problems, we need massive and invasive government control, forced adoption of renewable energy, forced adoption of the green economy, and an increase in government at local, state, federal, national, global levels. <laughs> I got to give you a little audio here. We have arrived at a moment of decision. Our home, Earth, is in danger. What is at risk of being destroyed is not the planet itself, of course. But the conditions that have made it hospitable for human beings. And we know the facts. It's not any more debate. This is global warming or not. We have global warming. And uh, the fact also is that we can do something about it. Well, former Vice President Gore and former Governor Schwarzenegger have adopted the ideology of climatism, the belief that man made greenhouse gases are destroying Earth's climate. And they're in good company. Today, 193 of 194 of the heads of state of the nations of the earth say they believe in the theory of man-made warming. All of our major scientific organizations, most of our major universities, most of the Fortune 500 companies, the United Nations, the news media, all have signed up to catastrophic man-made climate change. And the world is spending over $250 billion a year to try and decarbonize. The American journalist Henry Louis Mencken said, for every complex problem, there's a simple theory that's wrong. <laughs> and so let's, example this, let's examine, let's review, again, the simple science behind the theory of man-made global warming. Four basic concepts. One is the greenhouse effect. Sunlight enters our atmosphere. It's absorbed by the surface of the earth. 
Like any warm body, the surface of the Earth gives off lower energy infrared radiation. A little bit of that goes directly back into space, but almost all is captured by greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. And then these uh, greenhouse gases re-radiate that energy. That does tend to warm the surface of the planet. The second basis is rising atmospheric carbon dioxide levels. Modern measurements in 1957 showed about 315 parts per million. Just two months ago, we passed 400 parts per million. The proponents of the theory of man-made warming say this rise is due to mankind's industries, and this is adding to our greenhouse effect and raising the surface temperature of the planet, which is the third basis for the theory, rising global surface temperatures. According to the leading institutions, uh, those temperatures have gone up about a degree in the last 130 years, 0.7 degrees Celsius or 1.3 degrees Fahrenheit. And the fourth basis is computer model projections, like this supercomputer at East Anglia in the United Kingdom. These models predict a much faster rise, about 3 degrees Celsius or 5.4 degrees Fahrenheit on average, by the year 2100. But ladies and gentlemen, there is no empirical evidence that increase in greenhouse gases are the primary cause of global warming. Governor Chris Christie of New Jersey says climate change is occurring and humans play a contributing role. Now, I actually expect most people in this room would agree with that. I agree with that statement, but that's a meaningless statement. First, climate change is occurring, and the, the uh, parallel statement, climate change is real, that's like saying grass is green or water is wet. Global warming is real. Global cooling is real. Climate change is not only real, it's continuous. It's been happening for all of human history. And Anthony Watts and others are going to cover that uh, today, I think. Humans play a contributing role. Well, my 12-pound dog contributes to climate change. The question is, how big is the contribution? And more and more science shows that man-made impacts are very small. Earth's climate is complex. It's a powerful inter interplay of forces from our solar system, the atmosphere, the oceans and the deep oceans, and the land. For example, sunlight hits our tropical regions directly. Much energy is absorbed. And our polar regions indirectly little energy is absorbed. All weather on Earth is driven by this re redistribution of heat from the tropics to the poles. Clouds and weather play a powerful force in climate, very little understood. The oceans are a powerful part of the climate. The Gulf Stream, for example, uh, creates those warm temperatures in Europe. And then we have aerosols that come from volcanoes, pollen from trees, desert dust, man-made emissions, all play a role in climate. And this chart, of course, uh, understates a lot of the forces and misses a lot of them that are there. But today's climate scientists are obsessed with carbon dioxide, a tiny part of our atmosphere. And indeed, CO2 is a trace gas. If we picture a basketball arena with 10,000 fans and Think about those representing 10,000 molecules in our atmosphere. Then only four of those are carbon dioxide. And the amount that, could have, that mankind could have contributed in all of human history is only a fraction of one of those molecules. By the way, what's nature's most abundant greenhouse gas? I, I know that many of you know that. This is a very educated group. But I go to other groups and I guess carbon dioxide or methane but the answer, of course, is water vapor. And most scientists estimate, including uh, Gavin Schmidt, that somewhere between 75 and 90 percent of Earth's greenhouse effect is due to water vapor and clouds. So if we're conservative and we say 75 percent, then of that last quarter, most of that is caused by carbon dioxide, some by methane and other gases. But then we need to ask, well, of that last quarter, how much is due to man-made emissions and how much is natural. Because the oceans contain about 50 times as much carbon dioxide as the atmosphere dissolved, and the oceans are always releasing carbon dioxide and absorbing it. 
When plants grow, they absorb carbon dioxide. When they die, carbon dioxide is released. And then we have volcanoes both above the surface of the ocean, about 10 times as many under the surface of the ocean, and we have no idea how much uh, those are releasing. But all of those release gases, carbon dioxide and other gases, into the environment all the time. It turns out that when you look at that last quarter, about 96% of that is from natural emissions of carbon dioxide. That means the man-made portion of the greenhouse effect is about one part in 100. One part in 100. If we completely eliminated all emissions, we probably couldn't tell the distance, could not measure the difference in global temperatures. Now, if Detective Dirty Harry was a climate scientist, he'd probably say, your climate models ain't making it. And indeed, for the, more than the last 10 years, global surface temperatures have been flat. Yet, put together by Roy Spencer and John Christie, 44 climate models, the top models in the world, by the way, they recently uh, uh, updated this to show 73 of the top climate models. They all, they all, they all failed to predict flat global temperatures over the last 10 to 15 years. So the next time somebody says to you, well, 97% of the scientists agree, just tell them, yeah, but 100% of the climate models that all those papers were written on are wrong. And woe to those who challenge the theory of man-made global warming. They're called deniers, as in Holocaust deniers. They're called criminals. Uh, they're called, they said that they're in the pay of the oil companies. And my hat's off to Art Robinson and Anthony Watts, Willie Soon, uh, Fred Singer, and the other great scientists for standing up and being courageous on this issue. They're going to be proved right in the future. By the way, they don't like our books either. This is an interesting picture that was posted on the website of San, ha San Jose State University about three months ago. And it shows the uh, head of the Department of uh, Meteorology and Climate Science right here holding a match and one of her scholars. And they're doing a flammability test on my book, <laughs> The Mad, Mad, Mad World of Climatism. They took this down in about a day. Twelve articles were written on it, and then they uh, apologized, of course. But if you want to find out why uh, leading climate uh, departments are burning my book, there's some copies out there I'll be happy to sign. <laughs> I think Dr. Singer put it, put it best. Nature, not human activity, rules the climate. And more and more science evidence is showing that the effect of ocean cycles, clouds and weather driven by the sun are the dominant effects in climate change and man-made influences are very small. Anyway, to get back to sustainable development, the second foundation is that we're increasingly polluting the world. And that's best characterized by an equation by Paul Ehrlich of Population Bomb fame and John Holdren, most recently the top science officer of the United States, and their IPAD equation. I, environmental impact, is a product of population times affluence, which is per capita income, times technology. And that was adjusted uh, uh, along the way to define affluence and technology as energy. So environmental impact is a, is a product of population times energy usage. And this is at the basis of the 40-year law, 40-year uh, war on energy by all of the environmental groups. If you use more energy, you have to be destroying the environment. And we'd all like our air and water to be clean, right? Anyone here wants dirty air and water? I'm old enough to remember when, uh, when the air wasn't so clean. Uh, one camping trip, we drove past uh, Gary, Indiana, steel mills, and this green, green film covered.